Mr. Minister, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, you are very warmly welcome to the conference Nordic Baltic Visions for Europe. Does the European Union unite or divide the Nordic Baltic region? And this event is organized by the Estonian Foreign Policy Institute, which operates under the International Center for Defense and Security, together with the representation of the European Commission in Estonia and the Friedrich Ebert Foundation. And my name is Kristi Raik. I am the director of the Estonian Foreign Policy Institute, and I am very happy to welcome you on behalf of all the organizers. Some of you joined us uh, last night for the conference dinner, where we heard a very inspiring speech by Uffe Eleman Jensen, and we started our discussions on European security and defense, on European values, also touching upon the United States and Russia, about the future of Europe, the reforms that are to be are ongoing in the European Union. So we continue our discussions today. And why are we discussing the future of Europe from the Nordic Baltic angle in the Nordic Baltic framework? Uh, why this particular focus? Um, after all, you may wonder, the regional groupings in the European Union are often exaggerated. Uh, when we look at the Nordic Baltic positions on many EU matters, they are quite uh, different. But we are living in times uh, where we see big shifts taking place globally and within the Western community and within Europe. And I, I believe that these big changes are pushing small states in our region, in the northern part of Europe, uh, closer together. There is no doubt that the EU is very important for the Nordic Baltic, Baltic countries. The EU has become like air that we breathe, and sometimes we maybe don't like the smell, but we can't really imagine living without it. Looking at the Brexit process, uh, I think this only confirms uh, such uh, sentiment. And as Uffe Eleman Jensen reminded us yesterday, the weight of small states in the European Union system is exceptionally strong relative to the large member states. And yet it is always a challenge for the smaller member states to find ways to influence decision making in the EU. And uh, it is always a must to team up with like-minded partners. So this is what we will discuss today. We will look at what are the shared views and interests of the Nordic Baltic countries in the EU. Where are the main differences? How does the European Union shape our region? And how can we influence the direction of the EU? And now I'm very happy to give the floor for opening speech to the Foreign Minister of Estonia, Sven Mikser. Please, thank you for coming. Well, a very good morning, ladies and gentlemen. It's a great pleasure uh, for me to, to be able to welcome you here in Tallinn, particularly those who have come from outside our beautiful capital city. Uh, I was asked by the organizers to be here 10 minutes before the, 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 the opening of the um, session of the conference, and, and having climbed those stairs, I can understand why, so as to, to uh, give me some time to catch my breath. Well, uh, the uh, conference today is appropriately titled uh, The Nordic Baltic Visions of, uh, for, for Europe. I believe that we all uh, have our visions of Europe, we also have our visions for Europe, um, but we should probably also be reminded of the uh, old saying that a vision without a plan is a is hallucination. So I think that it's it's very appropriate to also to to uh, think and, and 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 plan and plot as to uh, how we can uh, actually uh, move towards uh, the realization of, of 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 that vision or the parts of that vision that we share among the Nordic and Baltic uh, countries. 
uh, the, the second half of the title, um, how, the, uh, how the European Union uh, unites or divides our region, I think we should perhaps uh, uh, reverse and ask how, how we can shape Europe in the way that it would accord our visions and our plans. Um, I believe that, that uh, the, the Nordic uh, Baltic uh, region or the regional countries in the Nordic Baltic, Baltic uh, area uh, share um, a lot when it comes to how we, how we see the future of uh, Europe. Obviously, the, the regional cooperation has uh, uh, many different faces or facets. Uh, there's the economic uh, dimension to that uh, cooperation. Uh, there are uh, policy areas where, where we are bound to work together uh, because of the regional bonds or geographical proximity. Uh, uh, there are um, political uh, groupings that bring us together. Uh, but, um, but I think that above all, uh, what we share is uh, an understanding that we need to work very hard uh, the, in, in this these days at this time uh, to uh, see that this uh, rules-based international order uh, that we all have benefited from so much uh, does not crumble under this, uh, I would say, very considerable stress. Uh, the uh, the uh, rules-based order and obviously the rules are derived from these uh, uh, common values and, and belief in li uh, liberal democracy uh, that have, I think, been the, the uh, um, founding blocks of, 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 of the Western world uh, for, for decades and even centuries. Uh, these rules are under, uh, under, under threat, or under, under serious challenge, fr uh, both uh, from without and from within. Uh, we see uh, players, important and powerful players in, in global geopolitics who would like to uh, restructure or rebuild the, the, uh, the international order uh, who would like to see the, um, the, the, these, these, these rules give, uh, give way to the, uh, to the uh, right of the, of the might. Uh, we also, within our own societies, the uh, illiberal voices or radical populist voices uh, gaining strength and at this time, I think that in order to preserve both the, the Nordic way of living, as well, we sometimes uh, romantically call it, and to preserve the uh, rules-based uh, international order that also uh, gives, um, well, as, as uh, Christy said, a stronger voice to the, to the small countries uh, within the European Union and on the international scene, um, more, more, more power. So we, uh, I think, uh, have a lot that we share. Perhaps uh, the, uh, um, there was a, a somewhat clearer idea as to what the regional cooperation um, in the political sense should look like back in the 1990s when, uh, when the Baltic countries were breaking free from the uh, Soviet occupation and, and uh, were aspiring to join the interna rejoin the international community. And back then, I think, that there was also a, a shared a uh, sense of purpose among the Nordic countries in order to, to help us to bring about that change. Uh, I think that since then, with our uh, struggle to, to, to gain full membership in, uh, in the European Union and in, 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 in NATO, uh, we, to a degree, perhaps lost the sense of purpose in, 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 in the uh, regional cooperation within our closer, closer geographical neighborhood. Um, but I think that, that uh, the way that uh, the uh, trilateral Baltic cooperation and, and, and the Nordic cooperation have uh, come closer and closer and, and in very many areas have uh, basically merged to become one Nordic Baltic uh, uh, cooperation. I think that, that we have brought this uh, sense of purpose uh, back in very many policy areas. And uh, with the, uh, well, Tensions and challenges uh, looming in the in the in the transatlantic cooperation, uh, with uh, the balance of power within the European Union changing, uh, with the uh, 
uh, with the Brexit process. I think that, that uh, this uh, regional grouping of the Nordic Baltic countries within the EU uh, has, has actually acquired uh, much more, uh, a much stronger meaning and, and there is much stronger need for, for a strong Nordic Baltic voice. And even I would go so far as to suggest that, that perhaps we should uh, be seeking to, to uh, enlarge or broaden that group of like-minded nations, the nations who, who want to play by rules when it comes to uh, the uh, economic developments, uh, the, 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 the budgetary processes within the European Union, as well as, as, as pre def defend the rule of political and, and, and security uh, architecture that we've that we've built up uh, on the European continent and beyond since, since the end of the Second World War. And I think there are other like-minded uh, nations and, and th there are those nations who, who are equally or, or similarly uh, concerned uh, by, by those developments, uh, countries like Ireland, like Netherlands and, 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 and others. And um, I think that it's, it's entirely appropriate that we also uh, seek to, as a group, to, to cooperate more closely uh, with those countries who share those concerns and also share those, those visions and perspectives that we have in the Nordic Baltic uh, region. Uh, I was told that, that recently uh, one Estonian uh, polling agency uh, conducted a, 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 a survey where they asked uh, people as to how they see the uh, Perspectives, or what, what do you think of the of the cooperation of the Baltic countries within within Nordic countries? And and to no surprise at all to me, uh, the the support for Nordic Baltic cooperation was in in the 90 in in the 90s. We've always uh, enjoyed very strong support for the European Union and Estonian, Estonian membership in the in the European Union, uh, but that support is uh, in. The, well, in high 60s, low 70s, uh, normally, and the same goes for 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 the, for the uh, security cooperation in NATO. But I think that that uh, or the 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 uh, uh, belief uh, that, that there is very strong belief in, uh, in 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 our society among the people in Estonia that that uh, the our our closest and 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 dearest partners with whom we share the most when it comes to both interests and values are in our, our uh, Nordic Baltic uh, neighborhood. And I think this is a very good platform to redefine the, 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 the common purpose and, and, and make sure that those uh, uh, visions become, become reality even uh, while we see uh, well, quite formidable challenges on on the horizon, I wish you a very successful uh, conference and, and, and substantial discussions and exchanges of ideas on, uh, in, in regarding all different policy, policy areas, because the European Union obviously is a very complex organism. Thank you very much for, for being here. Ladies and gentlemen, good morning. My name is Stephen Blockmans. I'm the head of the EU Foreign Policy Unit and the Politics and Institutions Unit at CEPS in Brussels, Center for European Policy Studies. Um, thank you very much to, to Christy, to the, to the Institute for inviting me to, um, to this conference. It is my pleasure and privilege to try and moderate uh, four brilliant minds um, on the topic um, of uh, Nordic-Baltic cooperation or challenges uh, in the face of um, the future of Europe debate. Um, and uh, before I introduce the, uh, the panelists, let me, let me briefly perhaps sketch out the, uh, the main topics which could frame uh, this debate. I think um, the Brexit referendum in June 2016 
has kick-started a debate, um, especially at, Brat at the Bratislava summit between uh, the 27, which is immediately after the summer, about the future of Europe. And the imagery back then in Bratislava was not very conducive to, uh, to a good debate, it seems, with a boat uh, that due to low water levels um, uh, had to actually return quite quickly to, uh, to Bratislava. Um, it nevertheless slowly but surely developed and matured in, uh, in a debate against uh, a backdrop of existential crisis of the future of the EU itself. Remember back then, um, there was a fear of major populist gain, um, anti-EU, and certainly Eurosceptic uh, parties coming to the fore, and especially in France. And whereas with hindsight, we can see that um, this existential crisis has been averted, we cannot say that the populist tide has been turned. Um, of course, in reaction to that, I think the more pro-EU voices, especially that of um, President Macron in his Sorbonne speech, have been on the offensive, on the EU reform uh, debate. And um, Macron himself, of course, has not minced his words about what, to his mind, a future of Europe minus the UK should look like. And he has proposed, uh, of course, bold steps to strengthen the Eurozone. He has even floated ideas later on shared with, um, uh, with Germany in the Meseberg Declaration about introducing more qualified majority voting in the Council, especially as far as CVSP, Common Foreign and Security Policy, is concerned. Um, and um, he has used, you know, the, the phrase of a multi-speed Europe as um, uh, quite, quite liberally, uh, one, could, uh, one could say. Um, I think especially the, the Meseberg Declaration underpins, even if the reaction from Berlin came quite late as a result of difficult coalition talks, of course, I think the Meseberg Declaration nevertheless um, almost codifies the new Franco-German axis or engine of the European integration process. Is big member state politics back in Europe? And is this to the detriment, ultimately, of the smaller member states? And um, coupled, I think, with the Brexit story, where you have a, a vocal uh, proponent of liberal uh, economic philosophy exiting the European Union, one that often acted as a cheerleader of similarly minded smaller uh, member states, um, one wonders again what, what impact that has on those uh, smaller member states. And finally, ahead of the end of this legislature at EU level, we get discussions on the next multi-annual financial framework, the MFF, uh, which project a massive increase, 30% or so, in the area of EU external action, but at the same time see, or propose at least, a decrease of about 5% of the common agricultural policy and 7% of the cohesion funding of the European Union. Two areas which traditionally have been um, to the benefit of smaller member states, especially also in this region. So I think this panoply of issues um, provides both the, uh, the importance to, to discuss EU reform from a Nordic-Baltic uh, perspective um, with the idea in mind whether it is indeed considering the differences which have traditionally existed between some of the Nordic and Baltic states, whether there is in fact more room for cooperation, whether there is a natural force for cooperation. I think this is one of the guiding questions for this panel if not uh, this conference. We will steer clear mostly of CFSP, knowing, of course, that this is a topic for discussion uh, later on. Now, with us to discuss all of these issues, um, we have uh, Katharina Engberg, uh, who is a senior advisor at CIEPS, the Swedish Institute for European um, Policy Studies. Um, 
but in, in a previous capacity, um, director at uh, the Prime Minister's office, uh, EU Coordination Secretariat in particular, and also posted to Brussels at the Perm Rep um, uh, to the EU, but also uh, uh, at NATO. Um, to my immediate right here, Mati Masikas, of course, known well, uh, well known in this country as Under Secretary um, for European Affairs at the MFA, and also as um, well, Mr. Brexit uh, for Estonia, the coordinator on, um, <laughs> on Brexit issues uh, for, uh, for the government. Um, to his right, Ilse Ruse. Yes. Good. Ambassador extra, Extraordinary and Plenipotentiary uh, of the Republic of Latvia to not just the Netherlands as the program states, but in fact all of the Benelux countries based in The Hague. Um, and on the basis of your academic interest and your PhD, which dealt with the question, why neighbors cooperate, mm -hmm. the PhD you, you defended in Salzburg, of course, uh, keeping a keen eye as to what the Benelux might be up to, if anything at all. Um, but we'll be keen to hear that from you. And uh, last but certainly not least, Professor Marlene Wint, um, Director at the Centre for European Politics at the University of Copenhagen and also a Professor at the Centre of Excellence for, uh, for Research on International Courts, I-Courts. So welcome to uh, all of you. We've agreed amongst ourselves that introductory remarks will be restricted to about 10 minutes. Um, Katharina, I would like to, after which there will be plenty of room for, for exchange and debate with the audience. Uh, Katharina, why don't we start with you, the Swedish uh, perspective. Thank you. I'll take your seat. Thank you so much, Stephen, for that introduction and also to the uh, organizers of the conference for having me here. I certainly look forward to listening in to the discussion amongst the Nordic Baltic, uh, not only member states, but uh, individuals representing many perspectives. And I, I think I learn a lot from uh, today's exercise. Also, I'm very pleased to be back in the beautiful city of Tallinn that I have visited several times over many years. Uh, I'm glad to be at this conference. Some, at the same time, I regret not being able to walk around in the lovely summer weather uh, and uh, in the old part of the city and along the city's shores. But maybe I'll have some time at the end of the conference. <laughs> I will run through very quickly uh, a number of points, uh, con being confident that uh, these topics are familiar to the audience, but please bear with me if I'm swift in my introduction. I will depict my own country's position, a little about its character, its position on a number of the issues raised here, uh, and then talk about the Nordic Baltic region and uh, maybe propose some issues for our common agenda. First then about Sweden. Um, Sweden is, uh, professes to be at the core of the European Union. However, realistically, I would say this is a reluctance uh, but loyal member of the European Union. It uh, applied for membership uh, <laughs> only after having been hit by the economic crisis in the early 90s, when it felt forced for economic reasons to join. Not that it was hostile in any way uh, to uh, European cooperation, but it felt it managed on its own uh, previous to that economic crisis, which changed the perspective. It is a country that is fiercely attached to national sovereignty, at the same time, one of the most globally oriented and interdependent uh, nations in the world, uh, trying to find the regional uh, layer within that global society and the mix of policies on a national, regional and global level that sort of uh, um, addresses our needs. Uh, it's a trading nation, primarily. It's not primarily motivated by security, although the importance of security has risen, as has been alluded to. Uh, uh, it said no to, the, to joining the Euro in a referendum in 2003. Um, however, with this reluctance or ambivalence uh, that characterizes my, my country's attitude towards the European Union, uh, it is sort of um, now identifying, its, identifying itself as a member, warming to the idea uh, and once a member, even if you don't like all the policies, you have to implement them. You have to abide by the rules. 
So that's a sort of uh, an interesting uh, combination of uh, attitudes, uh, I'd say, rather Swedish in character. Its agenda has, pr has traditionally been focused on uh, employment, environment, and previously an emphasis on enlargement. I would say, too, the agenda has now been added the social pillar, uh, the need to balance the internal market with uh, social uh, considerations as a means of addressing counter-reactions to negative aspects of globalization and promoting uh, Swedish... Um, um, favorite issues such as the investment in human capital, promoting gender equality, etc. But the rule of law is also becoming increasingly important for the uh, Swedish agenda, not only the Swedish agenda, but for my country. And I need not need to mention migration. Um, after Brexit and also the accession of Trump to the presidency of the United States, you have noticed uh, a considerable jump in EU positive attitudes in my country, very much along the same lines as for most of the member states of the European Union. So that's where we situate ourselves currently. We have warmed to the idea gradually. We wait to see, we wait and see, and then we join. Um, we are intergovernmental in principle, uh, but federalist in case of need to add to the uh, complexity of attitudes. So we would say no to single presidency ideas, Spitzenkandidat, uh, all things, proposals that sort of withdraw authority from national parliament and that sort of politicize, as Swedes would see it, or Swedish government would see it, a uh, more politicized commission. We would rather support the idea of a technocratic commission that uh, is the uh, spokesperson for the small and medium-sized countries uh, and member states of the European Union. Uh, I don't think that comes as a surprise in depicting my, uh, the attitude uh, of uh, my, my country and maybe some other similar nations as well. With regard to uh, differentiation of integration, we say, well, it's already there. It's uh, part of the makeup of the European Union. But of course, we have a focus now on the uh, eventual uh, uh, further integration within the Eurozone, since we are not a member of the Euro. So again, our attitude is uh, uh, we don't want to uh, be uh, left out from uh, an, uh, a deepening integration within the Eurozone. However, we don't intend to join the Euro anytime soon. Uh, so how do we square uh, how do we find a room where we will influence uh, decision-making in eventual deepening integration with the, uh, within the Eurozone? Hence, our joining with uh, the Nordic Baltic countries, uh, Ireland and the Netherlands, uh, in the joint letter, letter of our finance ministers. At the same time, as we are anxious not to be left out, we wish the Eurozone well. We depend on it. Uh, our economy wouldn't flourish without it. Uh, so, in principle, we support the necessary measures for overcoming the lack in terms of architecture from which the Eurozone suffered in the, later, in the uh, last economic crisis. We see the need for further integration. We would back uh, probably the banking union. There is now um, an uh, investigation going on within the Swedish government offices. Uh, and we are interested, of course, in... Uh, in uh, an internal market for, uh, for the capital, for flows of capital as well, improving the flow uh, of capital. So a capital, um, um, uh, so that these are sort of pragmatic aspects of the deepening of the Eurozone cooperation that we would probably support uh, from the beginning. In terms of institutional matters further, we are reluctant to the proposals for passerelles uh, for a passage from consensus to uh, qualified majority voting, and we will listen carefully to what President Juncker will say in his uh, State of the Union talk next week, I think. Uh, however, uh, we are increasingly um, restless with regard to member states that are blocking decision-making on issues that we find being of importance, such as, for example, the backing of the UN's uh, migration compact, um, or the uh, e very vague statements or lack of statements made by the European Union on, for example, the US recognition of Jerusalem as the capital of Israel. So on a number of issues, we are increasingly restless with the tendency of some member states of blocking decision-making, particularly in, in terms of foreign policy. 
I said we are intergovernmental, in, in fiercely intergovernment in, in, in our attitude, but federal in case of need. And I will not expand much on this matter, but let me just point to migration policies, where my country represents a very ambitious agenda within the U European Union, uh, with quotas, distribution of quotas of uh, migrants, and, and in particular of refugees uh, coming to uh, the European Union. So this is a portrait of a nation which may be, have some characteristics that are specific for my country, but I think this is also a portrait of many other nation states or member states of the European Union uh, who try to orient themselves in a changing landscape. I think it's a good example of what the, the uh, British historian and political uh, scientist Millwood called that uh, the European Union uh, or the cooperation within the uh, European community and union and the uh, federal elements uh, of that cooperation is the rescue of the nation states. Under pressure, convinced that the federal element is necessary, nations will, after having tested the water, eventually join uh, in uh, recognizing the need for federal elements. The EU Nordic Baltic region then, well, we share a common history, uh, geography, there's a lot of affinity, and we are bound together, I think, by an increasing concern for in regards to security matters, as was referred to by the foreign minister, for example. We share uh, an adherence to what I think we would like to see a modernist agenda when it comes to openness, information, technology, etc. We are so-called fiscally conservative, although I would say that uh, it's important not to lump together different national perspectives. My country is, uh, uh, will support, of course, one of the main messages of the common um, a letter, uh, which is that structural reform needs to be undertaken uh, when we talk about solidarity uh, between uh, the member states of the European Union. And uh, ideally, first structural reform uh, before implementing more larger uh, agendas when it comes to solidarity. Uh, but we have, of course, differences in terms of austerity policy. My nation, I wouldn't say we are an adherence to austerity policies. And we have naturally differences when it comes to the, uh, to the budget. We are net contributors. Uh, some of the members of the Nordic Baltic region are uh, are re net uh, receivers from the, from the budget and uh, uh, with the uh, Brexit, Brexit and the exit of the Britain, Great Britain, at least uh, let's hope not, but uh, we have to count on this, uh, a larger burden will fall on uh, the net contributor, contributors. Our, fa our finance ministers, minister has calculated that the, the multi-annual framework, it might add up to 1.5 billion euros a year in addition for Sweden. So, of course, we will guard very carefully against uh, the way how this budget is, uh, is distributed. I would say that uh, while in general with regard to our region, uh, when we go on defining our common interests, I think it's important to try uh, to reach out to other parts of Europe. I think it would be while identifying a common agenda we have to guard against becoming some sort of northern flank, northern front. We shall try always to reach out to other parts of Europe, to southern Europe, to central and eastern European countries, uh, and try to find, as we define our own interest, interest also try to define the common interests. Um, we are, as a country, uh, and I think that goes also for some other members of this group, often of an Anglo-Saxon leadership in crisis. Uh, this is the leadership of the Western world, which is currently in crisis, and we are trying to orient ourselves in a more continentally oriented European Union, um, which is, uh, of course, uh, Germany and France have always been of major importance to us, but do we have to pay more attention to policies coming out of Germany and France? And I, for, um, for one, think that we are in a natural stage of um, revitalization of the German-French axis. Uh, at this point, of course, we should be attentive, but we shouldn't fear it. I think it's important in order to kickstart the European Union after all the existential issues that have risen lately and have been defined previously. The question is, is this tr being translated eventually into common 
positions that include uh, all of the member states, and that's where we have to be active. Uh, but I think it's a natural uh, development and should not be seen as, um, as something that we should um, be sus suspicious about. We just need to learn and to, be, to smarten up. Uh, several of you have already, or in the introductory remarks, you have alluded to the fact that we cannot define our own interests without understanding the global pressures that we are under. Um, uh, this is not anymore, if it had ever been, an isolated uh, region of the world. We are profoundly impacted by Chinese policies, we know Russian policies, but now we have to calculate the development of American policies as well. So for the agenda, security, I think it's increasingly important. Trying, we are very grateful for the support of this group in defining our interests in case there is a deepening of Eurozone integration in terms of uh, making sure that we are not being left out. I think we have a common agenda with the future development of, of, of information technology, artificial intelligence. We should be at the forefront in defining these issues. And then investment in human, cap in human capital, gender equality being just one of the aspects. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, also for extrapolating um, to other regions. Um, and I think we'll have a bit of a singing chairs um, effort here. Mati, if I can already uh, invite you to the stage, then perhaps Katarina can take yes. your seat. Thank you. For an Estonian perspective. Thanks, Stephen. <coughs> um, a bit differently from, from um, Sweden. Estonia has been always, uh, throughout our, uh, our membership, a loyal and not so reluctant member state uh, in this, in this union, union of ours. Um, we started to learn, uh, we started to know, we started to learn about these things, how to p position uh, oneself and, and so on. Um, learning from the... Uh, uh, naturally, from the experiences of uh, what was then the previous enlargement uh, from our uh, from our Nordic neighbours, mainly, and studied studied the Swedish and Finnish models or approaches, uh, uh, respectively, and ended up uh, ended up adopting pretty much or leaning towards the towards the Finnish approach and not. The, and not the Swedish, uh, meaning meaning um, courageously uh, striving to be uh, in the core of the EU, to adopt all forms of, of integration, uh, and to 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 support and trust the strong EU institutions, as opposed to to the. Um, uh, in the intergovernmental uh, cooperation, it of course has to do. One has, one has to bear in mind always uh, the membership. The Estonian, the Estonian membership in the EU is very much about security as well. We can we can never uh, lying where we are. We never uh, never forget the security needs. And, and integration in such a strong uh, uh, union with such a strong sense of solidarity serves Estonian security interests uh, as well. Uh, so um, we learned the models and or the approaches of our closest neighbors. Then we then we got in, of course, started to started to gather our own experience. Um, and it has taken time, or it took time. Um, the EU is not uh, the EU is absolutely impossible to to learn to know from outside, uh, and even from inside, it's. Uh, it's quite an achievement to, to learn the ways, and sometimes still, um, even working in Brussels, uh, you have this feeling like um, you, you, you don't really grasp all the details, you don't know all the background stories and the history. Um, I, I once 
talk to a man, a middle-aged man, who uh, had moved from, uh, from mainland to an Estonian island, community of 50, uh, um, and had lived there for 10 years. I asked him, well, how do, have you been accepted by locals? How do, how do, you, how do you feel? And, uh, he said, no, no I, I don't have any problems with locals. All, all goes well and smoothly. Of course, he added, if you, uh, in order to understand all the details, you need to be born on the island. Um, so, and sometimes still, even today, <laughs> when, I, when I hear uh, how my Luxembourg, say, colleagues discuss about, the, about some EU matters, uh, uh, mostly the in institutional matters. The, uh, and how the, how the EU institutions operate and interact, then I, um, <clears throat> I have this feeling that I, uh, I should have been born on that, on that island or would love, of course, would have loved to, to, be, um, to represent a, a founding member. Uh, uh, right. Um, if you don't have your own experience, you, uh, of course, tend to, you tend to be quite wary of the changes. I, I can recall one Estonian member of the uh, one Estonian member of the of the European Convention back in back in the last decade, um, going around humming "Give Nice a chance." Um, the Nice Treaty was the very was the very thing that the whole convention was supposed to change. Um, so, so if you don't have experience yourself, you 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 tend to be quite tend to be quite, quite conservative. Um, and we still don't, uh, as Estonia, we still don't have uh, that many ideas of the institutional setup or, or, or taking forward the, the institutional setup of the, of the EU. Um, of course, the treaty change has been off the table since at at least since the outbreak of the Greek crisis, or the Eurozone crisis. The heads of state and government have seen clearly that, that uh, in, the, in this atmosphere, in many member states, uh, opening the treaty uh, would mean, would, would, or, or ad adopting a new treaty would take referenda probably in more than just one member state. And the heads of state and government have quite wisely not been willing to, to, to take this, to take this, uh, this risk. The EU's everyday work is, of course, much more than institutional matters. And when, Stephen, when you started with the reference to, to Bratislava declaration, um, where, where the EU, the post-Brexit shock was overcome and, and a new direction for the Union was shown by, by, by the 27 leaders. Uh, the good thing, or the, for me, the, the best thing about Bratislava was that Bratislava was not about the institutional setup. The Bratislava, the Bratislava Declaration clearly states that it's not the institutions or the institutional setup that matters now, but, but what matters is is, uh, um, is how the union will regain its legitimacy uh, in the eyes of its citizens, and there a practical way was was shown. That was uh, that 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 is the the Bratislava spirit and the spirit that has 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 uh, helped the EU to, to regain its, its confidence ever since. Uh, so in this everyday's work of the EU, um, there, are no, uh, there are no standing alliances, there are no standing blocks. Um, because the variety of issues is so, uh, so broad. And there are no two member states agreeing all the time or, or voting together uh, all the time. And this, uh, it's, uh, uh, for, me, for me, maybe the most wonderful thing about, about operating in the, in the EU. They, in these everyday issues, the Nordic and Baltic member states quite often share positions. 
uh, but not always. Of course, not always, and this, uh, this common understanding is, is hampered by, um, by, first and foremost, by the different levels of integration of, 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 the, of, the, uh, of the Nordic Baltic countries. I most uh, sort of clearly felt that while, while discussing the banking union matters in Brussels, uh, representing a euro area country where the banking sector is heavily dominated by, by, by uh, uh, subsidiaries of non-eurozone, namely Swedish, Swedish banks. Um, with, do not fall under the supervision and the arrangements of the banking union. Uh, quite a uh, quite a task, of course. Uh, and of course, income levels, um, structure, economy, security concerns. All these issues matter in uh, in building coalitions uh, within the EU, including in uh, including in our in our region. Uh, it's true that in this post-Brexit uh, EU, a, a, a uh, search for new constellations is, is underway. Uh, it's nowhere better illustrated than in the case of Ireland. Um, I love that. Um, whereas, whereas previously the Irish diplomats in the EU matters could claim that they are an island behind an island. And the question is, an island behind what? Uh, are you now uh, in the in the EU affairs in the EU terms? Hence this, uh, hence these uh, new constellations. I don't like too much this new Hanseatic League thing. Um, seems too blockish for me. Um, but the truth is that after the departure of the United Kingdom issues like liberal trade or cases of liberal trade, um, deepening of the, of the single market, further deepening of the, of the single market, and of course are but will be uh, severely, severely affected. And so, so still, um, while, while, while not being such a fan of the new Hanseatic League um, slogan, I, I recommend you reading um, the Dutch Prime Minister Rutte's speech in the European Parliament uh, this July. He addresses clearly the leaders of the, of the biggest member states, Germany and France, saying, saying do, do you understand that now it's time to, to deepen, to further deepen the single market, in particular in the field of services. There's, for me as well, there's where they are. The proof of the new Franco-German engine or whatever is not in how, a, uh, how the um, discussion about the, about the majority voting in, in foreign policy could be launched. And the proof of this leadership, if this, if this leadership uh, wants to be real, and they, they need to show way and give ground in, in further, taking further the single market in services. That's where, we are, where our economy and the, our economic interests lie. Thank you. Thanks a lot, uh, Marty. I would like to use this uh, reference that you made to Mark Rutte's third way, if you want, uh, to introduce uh, Ilse to the, uh, to the podium. Thank you very much for both of your uh, interventions uh, so far, they, they, they've kicked up um, a few things. Um, liquid alliances, perhaps, in everyday practices. Um, block formation, which is difficult as a result of uh, differentiated positions uh, already of, uh, of member states. And I think these will at least be two issues, and there are many more on my little list that will be extrapolated when we hear the Latvian and the, the Danish uh, perspectives as well. So, Ilse, please. 
Thank you. Um, excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, um, first of all, I would like to thank uh, organizers for excellent organization of event and also inviting me. I have to point out that in this room there is a Latvian ambassador. So I'm not representing Latvian you in, 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 uh, in Estonia, but I'm really happy being invited because I can uh, offer you, uh, you a perspective of um, Nordic Baltic uh, grouping in action from outside, how this looks um, in a diplomatic life uh, uh, in, in Benelux uh, and uh, uh, what is the strengths and potential of this grouping and um, I aim to answer the question is there a Nordic Baltic coalition? Uh, should we call it rather a, a framework, a regional framework or grouping and uh, uh, if there is such a grouping, what is advantage of this grouping in action? And then uh, I will further uh, also address the aspect of um, uh, there is a, a, a newly branded um, acronym Nordic Baltic Plus. What is this plus and, uh, and why uh, Nordic Baltic grouping has uh, become attractive? Uh, to start with, I I would like to uh, emphasize that there is a very strong um, cooperation between the Baltic countries and, uh, and uh, traditional and historic cooperation between uh, Nordic uh, and Baltic. So three plus five uh, has been in place also supporting uh, the Baltic countries becoming EU members. Uh, but just to name that we have uh, Nordic countries, the largest investors in our region, so that the presence and interaction is, is evident uh, when we find ourselves inside the region. Uh, we actually pool power among Baltic states, uh, uh, in particular also this year when uh, the Baltic countries celebrate 100 years of state independence, uh, our centenary events we organized in The Hague, joint reception for centenary for the Baltics, uh, but it also um, is an advantage of pooling power in organizing visits, like joint visits by parliamentarian, uh, the chairman of foreign affairs committees going to New York, London, The Hague, uh, or uh, just the recent uh, uh, state visit by, by Dutch King to three Baltic states to emphasize that they are three, three different separate states, but still part of the same region with the same history. So to start with, there is a strong tradition. So we are not building this Nordic Baltic cooperation in EU as an artificial element, but it is just an added value to existing uh, cooperation that we already have uh, also with the support of um, Nordic Council offices and their agenda. So just to name it that there is um, a framework within which this Nordic Baltic cooperation is growing. Uh, now I would like to, uh, to address the aspects of uh, how we cooperate in Europe and here I would like to set scene uh, with three um, actually principles. Uh, the one principle is that there is increasing tendency of intergovernmental mode of decision mode making. Um, I would make a distinction that it is not like approach, but rather that the decisions, the very important decisions, are, um, are actually to some extent initiated by member states. Uh, just to remember the economic crisis and also activity of member states, large member states, in dealing with this crisis, a consequence of crisis, uh, also deal uh, with Turkey on migration was actually done in the scope of European Council. So this intergovernmental mode uh, explains also that the Lisbon Treaty has um, uh, defined European Council as a separate single institution. So the role of European Council is, is increasing and this is already calling for action from the member states um, and also the same applies to uh, uh, Foreign Affairs Council or other councils that actually deal with these um, important issues or even crisis situations in Europe. I would not undermine the role of the Commission, just to, to say that there is an intergovernmentalism uh, increasing also apart uh, from, from the, the, the um, uh, 
the way how the uh, um, how the uh, decision making and and policy making is initiated just to say like leaders agenda so the agenda by european council leaders in formulating future uh, targets the second aspect that i want to highlight here which gives also for nordic baltic group uh, a scene where to play is increasing role of informal agreement. It is like an iceberg. When the decision comes to the Council, the pre-agreement is already made in corridors or in uh, breakfast meetings. E even there is not a joke, but a, a kind of a fact to mention that if uh, uh, you want to really decide a sensitive issue uh, uh, in the EU, just don't plan it as a gender item, but plan it as a lunch item. Mm -hmm. So the inform in informal <laughs> way of decision is very, very important. And uh, this is where the Nordic Baltic cooperation comes in, because we have these uh, breakfast meetings, we have lunch meetings, Nordic Baltic uh, ministers meeting before a Foreign Affairs Council, Prime Ministers meeting between European Council meetings. And this is something that is in place since the membership of uh, three Baltic countries. 2004. And finally, the third aspect that is the scene where the Nordic Baltic cooperation actually is placed in, in Europe is the uh, already mentioned the challenge of distribution of power after Brexit. So this is something that is actually we have to face that by uh, if Britain leaves, then 12% of voting power leaves, and many cases, uh, in particular in security uh, issues, also on the internal market, uh, this region has very much been like following the British lead. So um, now I come to actually addressing this issue. On the one side, why do Nordic Baltic countries cooperate? And what is the potential of leadership? Because there is also two kinds of, or even three kinds of coalition. The one is issue-based coalition on the particular topic. And I would just be very clear, there's, an, there's no Nordic Baltic coalition. It is not such a single coalition crossing all the in, uh, issues in Europe. But there can be issues where our positions are close and in that case it gives additional strength that there is a Nordic Baltic framework and then they can come up with joint position papers. Can, and can I interrupt you just yeah. as a point of clarification? Are we talking about uh, the Nordic Baltic 6 or 8? The 6? We are just talking within EU we are but talking about Nordic exactly. Baltic 6 but I will come also to Nordic Baltic 8 in diplomatic interaction uh, but because uh, uh, we are speaking about EU member states in Europe, uh, wh which are uh, around the table in Council. Um, so, um, there is uh, my point was that there was not a single issue based uh, Nordic Baltic coalition, but the Nordic Baltic co coalition has a huge potential uh, when it comes to exchange of information. And this was also something that I, I um, actually proved through 50 interviews in my dissertation, uh, that um, interaction has a power uh, because informal exchange and also exchange of arguments and exchange of normative uh, arguments and, and trying also to explain position for the partners gives advantage and prepares these countries who are part of this interaction better uh, compared to the um, others um, 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 so, so that the, 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 the exchange itself is a benefit. And, um, and finally, my last point is that this group is perceived as a power. And this is very important. So there is a feeling among our partners that Nordic-Baltic interaction has a potential. And therefore, there is interest to actually to to join uh, this interaction, to, to, not to join this grouping. And this um, uh, happened, and also because of, um, um, of, of um, a distribution of power, so that the m small and medium-sized uh, member states can pull their power um, in decision-making. Uh, in um, March this year, 2018, on 5th of March, uh, eight finance ministers signed a joint letter, and uh, uh, this became uh, actually 
like called and named uh, by Financial Times as Hanseatic League, uh, where the, the Dutch and Irish uh, joined. To some extent, it was actually under leadership of, of Dutch. Um, so uh, by this, we can say that the third type of Nordic Baltic potential is actually taking a leadership. And this leadership taking is something that is very important. Uh, this idea was um, um, to I, I can uh, explain uh, also through the initiative by Dutch uh, uh, Prime Minister Mark Rutte in 2017 